For the first time, Jacob woke up in Bethel and said, The Lord is here, and I knew it not. He saw the ladder going to heaven. He saw the gate of heaven. He saw angels. And then he says, This is a terrifying place. In our imagination, the gateway of heaven is filled with welcoming saints and angels playing on harps. And as we approach heaven, that's the most beautiful welcome we will ever receive. And Jacob is saying, it's a terrifying place. How? I still remember the day when Miss Cecilia walked into class. It was about 40 years ago. Miss Cecilia was our English teacher. We all loved her. She was really fun. But that particular day, she walked into class in a very bad mood. And we all noticed it. And we all went silent. She walked down the aisle and she stopped at a particular desk and she glared at that boy. He was the most unruly boy in our class and she glared at him and said, please leave the class right now and come back after an hour because she knew what he would do for the rest of the class. And then she walked to the front and began her lecture. The class was maintaining pin drop silence. And this particular boy sat stone-faced and silent. He was in total embarrassment because of what Miss Cecilia did in front of everyone. At the same time, he knew he had brought it upon himself. So he was very upset with himself too. I know these details about this particular boy because that boy was me. The problem was I wasn't able to maintain a balance. I didn't know when I could have fun. And when I had to be serious. A unique feature of true Christianity is its balance. When people are not balanced, they go to either extremes. Some go to an extreme love-based Christianity, which is full of syrup and goo. Others go to the other end, where Christianity is all fire and brimstone. Some swing towards a lazy form of Calvinism where God does everything and we just do nothing. Others go to the other end to an extreme work-based Arminianism where we do everything and we are responsible for our fate. So we have these extremities in Christianity and this brings a big imbalance. Some say God wants us to be rich. He wants to bless us. Others say, no, he loves the poor. He wants us to remain simple and poor. Some adorn themselves with all kinds of fashion, saying, God cares only for the heart. Others say, no, and they dress in sackcloth. Some are like Martha's. They are very busy all the time. They have no time to pray. Some say they are like Mary's. They're just pretending. They just want to avoid work. Today, I want to address the balance of Christianity regarding one particular thing, and that is the presence of God. How do you react to God's presence? Do you find His presence awesome or awful? May God speak to us today through this message, The Reverence of God.
Father, we pray that you may speak to us. You prepared this word for your church. And everybody is waiting to listen to your voice. Holy Spirit, we pray that you may cause us to listen to your voice as the Spirit speaks to the church. Help us to listen, to understand, and let this word bring a revival in everyone's personal lives in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd like to draw your attention today to the book of Leviticus. Leviticus chapter 10, verse 3. Then Moses said unto Aaron, This is it that the Lord spake, saying, I will be sanctified in them that come nigh me, and before all the people I will be glorified. And Aaron held his peace. In the New American Standard Bible, it's a little clearer. God says, By those who come near me, I will be treated as holy. Those who come to me must treat me as a holy God. And then before all the people, I will be honored. This verse is telling us that when we relate to God in the right way, when our attitude to God's presence is correct, then He will be glorified through us before the whole world. We don't need to worry about the second part. That is what God will do. But we need to therefore ask ourselves, how do we treat the presence of God? Some are so frightened by God, they avoid His presence. Others become so slap happy, they disrespect it. Which attitude is right? Last month, we meditated on the household of Abram. We understood about the God of Abram, who's El Rui. And now we have moved on. But this God of Abram later came to be known as the God of Jacob. How many of you love the God of Jacob? What is our attitude to the God of Jacob? In Psalm 147, we are told to tremble at the presence of the God of Jacob. But then later in Psalm 146 verse 5, we are told, Happy is he that hath the God of Jacob for his help. So, do we tremble or should we be happy? Let me confuse you a little more before I enlighten you. Psalm 68 verse 8 says, The mountains quake and the earth shakes at the presence of the God of Israel. If the presence of God can make the earth shake, and then God says, my presence shall go with thee, I'd say, please, no, don't come. Maybe that's why David in Psalm 139 says, Oh, where can I flee from your presence? Is that it? Is God's presence so terrifying? And yet in Psalm 102, we read we can come before his presence with singing. So what is it? Paul says, no flesh should glory in God's presence. And yet, in Psalm 1611, we read in his presence is fullness of joy. You find this, this contradiction in the Bible. We are drawn to his presence, yet we are repulsed by his presence. Where is the balance? If God's presence is something so awesome, why does our text, the passage we began with, make us feel that his presence is awful? Because in verse 2, Leviticus chapter 10, if you read verse 1 and 2, the situation is this, that two sons of Aaron who were priests, they came into God's presence and did something wrong. Then fire came down and killed them. Is that presence something that we are drawn to? Would we not be terrified by His presence when we read these things? We've been hearing so much from the gospel about how beautiful our God is, that He's the Father of love and that we have been reconciled with Him. 
and we should love him with all our heart and rejoice in him but does this mean that he is a nice grandfather sitting in a rocking chair ignoring our sins and just waiting to bless his naughty grandkids is that the perception you have of god so what is the attitude i'm sure by now you've already guessed you have guessed that we must both love god's presence and fear his presence am i right i'm sure you feel that is the answer but the question is why must we fear god's presence one pastor preached like this he said that the fear of god is an old testament concept but in the new testament perfect love casts out fear so we should approach god not in fear but with boldness in love in joy you see that's because he doesn't know theology when a man doesn't know theology he preaches his opinions but the pulpit is not a place for the preacher to parade his personal opinions he has to say what the bible says yes we all loved miss cecilia but i lost my respect for her can you see how love can actually cast out the right fear so yes we must both love god and we must fear god i don't mean them to be two separate entities but a blend our attitude to god is not love sometimes and then fear sometimes but a blend of the two and what is the ratio 50-50 if you if you talk of ratio i think in legalistic churches probably it is 90-10 90% fear and very little love in other progressive churches it's right the opposite way it's probably 90% love and very little fear so some churches preach sulfur other churches preach syrup but the right ratio is a blend of 100 100 Dear church we need to understand this balance of love and fear this balance gives rise to another word please read psalm 89 verse 7 god is greatly to be feared in the assembly of the saints and to be had in reverence of all them that are about him reverence dictionaries cannot define this word correctly because they are not written by godly men who know the meaning of reverence what is reverence we need to look to the bible for a proper understanding reverence is related to fear the healthy fear but before i explain that let me first give you a clear illustration of how reverence was practiced in the bible and it's not reverence for god I'll give you an example of how a wife reverences her husband. Now we all know the history of David and Bathsheba. Some wives they weaponize the husband's past failures. They keep bringing up the failure. Every time the husband has something to say, they knock him down by bringing up the past. if the husband's failure can be a weapon for the wife then bathsheba had a nuclear bomb we know the history we know how she became his wife and yet if you read first kings chapter 1 verse 31 we see a shocking thing taking place there first kings 1:31 then bathsheba bowed with her face to the earth and did reverence to the king and said let my lord king david live forever 
my Lord, my King, bowing down in reverence. What is this? Bathsheba said, this man is my husband. And yet he is my King, he is my Lord. And I have to reverence him. She did not use the past against him. Of course, a wife must love her husband. But does that mean she can disrespect him, dishonor him? That is why the balance is called reverence. And that is why in Ephesians 5, Paul says, Husbands, love your wives. But then he says, a wife must reverence her husband. And we know that he's speaking symbolically as well. And he says, our husband is Jesus. We are his wife. And so what is the attitude we should have towards God? He is our husband and we must reverence him. So let us explore this word a little more. In the Bible, reverence always goes with fear. I've already given you a verse in the Old Testament, Psalm 89.7. But because that pastor preached and said it is an Old Testament concept, let me give you a verse from the New Testament. Please read Hebrews chapter 12, verse 28. Wherefore, we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. The Greek word for reverence is aidos. This word is a balanced word. It gives you this picture. You are looking at God in admiration, in awe, and you're singing, how great is this God? But sometimes we can be lost in our admiration. And as the songwriter says, Oh Jesus, Jesus, dearest Lord, forgive me if I say, For very love, thy sacred name a thousand times a day. I love Jesus so much, I want to mention his word a thousand times a day. But God, forgive me if in this utterance I dishonor your sacred presence. So what is reverence? While you're looking at God in admiration, you put your head down. Because you dare not look at him. So in reverence there is both majesty and modesty. You look and yet you don't look. It's like having an accelerator and a brake. Many drivers love the accelerator. But it is the brake that saves many lives. Yes, we must rejoice in God. And yet Psalm 2.11 says, rejoice with trembling. Dear church, we love God. We rejoice in God. We are grateful to God. But how much of that trembling is in you? Paul doesn't say, work out your salvation with love and grace. But he says with fear and trembling. And that is a New Testament concept. Jesus says, fear God. But how easy it is to drift away to one extreme and lose this beautiful aspect of fearing God. There are two narratives I'd like to present before you from the Bible. One from the Old Testament and the other from the New. Where the balance of reverence plays out well. The first is the parable of the Pharisee and the publican in Luke 18. We know the story, and so I will not burden you with the details. We know these two, the Pharisee and the publican, both entered the temple of God. Now I want you to note, the Pharisee was the saint of that time. Everybody looked up to the Pharisee as the spiritual man because of the way he prayed, the way he kept God's laws, and the way he knew all the doctrine about God. The Pharisee was the saint. He walked in first. He went right in, 
and he prayed a prayer. But when you analyze the Pharisee's attitude towards God and the words he uttered, it is so obvious he knew nothing about God at all. All Pharisees are merely actors. Today, the church has become a theater. Every Sunday, we have a show. Worship is a performance. The preaching has become a performance. And everybody acting. Some people don't even realize they are acting. They act like they know God. They act like they can represent God to the church. They talk from the Bible like they know about the power of God. They talk about the anointing like they know all about the Holy Spirit. But they don't realize they are acting. What a tragedy takes place in the Pharisee's life. He walks in, utters his prayer, and he walks out so pleased with himself. And Jesus says, this man was not justified by God. But then the other man, the publican, wasn't acting at all. And that is why he did everything right. Watch him. Listen to him and you observe something. Yes, he did walk into the temple. He approached God, but he stood at a distance. Do you see a balance? Fools rush in where angels fear to tread. This man didn't just rush in and say, oh, I can sit anywhere, I can behave any old how. No, he walked in and yet he kept a godly distance. And then he spoke to God directly. It means he knew he had the right to speak to God and yet he would not lift up his eyes. Do you see a balance? And then in his prayer, his words show that he was appealing to a God of mercy. So he knew that this is a merciful God. And yet he smote his breast and said, I am a sinner. He acknowledged who God was. But he knew fully well who he was. And there was a balance, a balance. This balance is called godly reverence. Let me take you to the other narrative. It's a story of Jacob. In Genesis chapter 28, we're going to read from the Good News Bible. But first, in Genesis chapter 28, Jacob is fleeing from Esau. We know the story how he cheated him, stole his birthright, and then ran away. On his journey, Jacob went to sleep. And he saw a dream that we all know, the dream of the ladder. And I imagine how we would react when we see a dream like that. He didn't see the devil. He didn't see hell. What he saw was the gateway of heaven. He saw a ladder reaching from earth to heaven. And he saw the angels of God walking up and down this ladder. Beautiful. And then he wakes up from the dream and listened to his words in verse 16 and verse 17 in the Good News Bible. Jacob woke up and said, The Lord is here. He is in this place and I didn't know it. He was afraid and said, What a terrifying place this is. It must be the house of God. It must be the gate that opens into heaven. Jacob did not just wake up from his sleep. Jacob woke up from a great blindness, a great ignorance that had plagued him. What did he say? The Lord is here and I knew it not. How many of you know God is here and yet you don't know it? Oh, saints who are so conscious of people around you, but completely oblivious to God in the midst of his people. Jacob was around 70 years old at this time. He was the grandson of Abram and Sarai. He was God's chosen patriarch to be and God would later be known as the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. And yet this man at 70 years he is scheming and conniving and deceiving and supplanting and cheating. This is his character. 
Because he was the chosen one. He was the grandson of Abraham. And yet he did not know the God of Abraham. But here, he wakes up for the first time and begins to realize the presence of God. And he starts trembling. He called the place Bethel. We all know the meaning of El from El Roy. Bethel means the house of God. But Jacob never knew El. He never knew God. He knew only the house of God. And there are so many saints in the house of God who are like Jacob. What is the first thing that Jacob did when he came to Bethel? He went to sleep. And there are many sleeping saints in Bethel. I don't mean physical sleep. There are many saints who, who sleep during the message. And I'm glad that I'm a comfort to them in at least that way, where they can turn on my message and the sound puts them to sleep. I don't mind. But I'm not talking of that. I'm talking about the spiritual sleep. Where, what is spiritual sleep? It means you are in church today and you're conscious of the people around you. You're conscious of what you're wearing. You're conscious of your image before the people. You're conscious of everything except El, except God. That is Jacob. For the first time, Jacob woke up in Bethel and said, The Lord is here, and I knew it not. And then he says, This is a terrifying place. Think about it. He saw angels. Would you see angels and say, Terrifying place? He saw the ladder going to heaven. He saw the gate of heaven. And why is he saying, Terrifying place? He didn't see hell, he didn't see demons. What is so terrifying about this place? And yet you observe, he did not run away. He didn't say it's a, it's a terrible place and run away. No. He raised up an altar and named that place. How is that possible? Terrifying. And yet he says, this is the gateway to heaven. There is something about this attitude, something healthy in Jacob's realization. This is not a terror that makes us run away, but no, it's a terror that makes us reverence God. For the first time, Jacob has a balance in his attitude towards God. Majesty and modesty, both the wow and the woe factors. Have you woken up, dear Christian? You say you love God, that's good, but do you fear Him? Do you realize what a terrifying place Bethel is? Now when I say terrifying place, I don't mean you're scared. I will talk about that a little later. But I want to know, while you love God, has fear blended into that love and given you a healthy attitude to God? This is something missing everywhere in so many churches. Christianity has changed. What was the result of this amazing vision and his realization and his revelation? This is the revelation that totally changed Jacob. What was the attitude this revelation gave him? Godly reverence. Before he thought he could live any old how, that's why he was so scheming and cunning. But now for the first time he realized, my God sees me. El Roy, God is watching me. He became conscious, so he began to look at God. And seeing God, that revelation changed him. And later we see how God honored this revelation. If you turn to chapter 31, Genesis 31, read verse 13. I am the God of Bethel, where thou anointest the pillar, and where thou vowest a vow unto me. Now arise, get thee out from this land, and return unto the land of thy kindred. Jacob saw a dream, 
but later god speaks to him and says i am the god who gave that dream to you god honored his revelation now here is something important why does jacob say this is a terrifying place this is the gateway of heaven in our imagination the gateway of heaven is filled with welcoming saints and angels playing on harps and as we approach heaven that's the most beautiful welcome we will ever receive and jacob is saying it's a terrifying place how is not the presence of god full of joy shouldn't this entrance into god's presence therefore be most attractive most appealing this is why the gospel is so important the gospel makes us understand that not a single person in the whole world is worthy to pass the gateway of heaven into the presence of god if you don't hear the gospel you will not know that no one except jesus is worthy to pass that door and appear before the father and he proved it in his resurrection by appearing before god on our behalf and entering the veil today if we have boldness to stand before the throne of god if we have boldness to approach the throne of god that boldness comes from the blood of jesus please read hebrews chapter 10 verse 19 having therefore brethren boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of jesus many have a wrong understanding of the blood of jesus many christians think that the blood of jesus is merely a cleansing agent like soap so whenever i sin i ask god to wash me oh wash me oh lord from my sins with your precious blood there is nothing wrong with that prayer but what is wrong is our understanding of the blood of jesus so please understand why the blood of jesus is so powerful first of all we know that jesus is sinless and his blood was sinless but it is the sacrifice of jesus that makes this blood powerful long after we have confessed all our sins you know for in first john we read if we confess our sins the blood of jesus cleanses us but long after we have confessed our sins to god with tears and the blood of jesus has cleansed us we must realize that we still deserve nothing but punishment why does god not punish us because we said sorry why does god not punish us because we shed tears because we were sincere no the reason god doesn't punish us is because our punishment was laid upon jesus god didn't just cancel our punishment and cancel our sin no the punishment came upon jesus and then for the sake of jesus god forgives us we are accepted by god for jesus sake i enter the the presence of god because i am accepted in jesus but i am still the sinner who sinned i am no better than those who go to hell when the great protestant reformer john bradford saw a criminal being led to the gallows this criminal was going to die he was a he was guilty of some terrible crime when we look at some of these stories about people who are put to death for the terrible things that they have done we think oh thank god i'm not so bad or i would have also been in that place but john bradford said there there that's me there go i but for the grace of god he didn't feel better but he felt that is that is who i am if not for the mercy of god this is the confession of someone 
who has realized the presence of God, someone who has woken up in Bethel and realized the truth of the gospel, realized his own unworthiness. When Isaiah was confronted with the presence of God, what a change it brought in his attitude. There is almost a historical change in Isaiah before and after Isaiah 6 where he has this experience. The moment he saw God, the man who was saying woe unto others, he said, woe is me, I am undone, I am doomed, let me die, let me go to hell, for I have seen the face of God, I have seen the presence of God. Even the seraphim, the burning angels, shield their faces without looking directly at the face of God. How do we know when someone has not experienced the glory of God? And yet they are in Bethel. Their flesh will glory in Bethel. That is, they will show themselves off. They will show their talents. They will show off their beauty. When they preach, they preach in a way that makes themselves appear to be very holy or very spiritual. So they will speak highly of themselves. They will speak highly of their church. When... The effect of a preaching makes you feel that the preacher or his church is very spiritual or very high. You know that man has not tasted the presence of God. Now, God may have given us talents and God may have given us beauty. But we must hide these things in God's presence. When I say hide, it doesn't mean don't use it. When you're given a talent by God, don't take the talent and hide it in the earth and say, I don't want to use it. That is what the wicked servant did. The wicked servant was given a talent and told, use it, but he hid it. So what is right? Hiding our talents or using our talents? We need to correct our attitude. When I say hide your talents in the presence of God, it does not mean do not use it. I mean do not use God's talents to show off yourself, but use your talents to show off God. Let people admire God through your talents. So dear church, have we this beautiful attitude of reverence? It will help you, it will preserve you, it will protect you. Do we truly fear God? What is the fear of God? I want you to understand that the fear of God doesn't mean you're scared of God. Not at all. You see, the Israelites were scared of God. And they begged Moses, please, you speak to us. Don't let God speak to us. We are scared of him. He's terrifying. We cannot handle him. Read Exodus 20, verse 19. And they said unto Moses, Speak thou with us, and we will hear. But let not God speak with us, lest we die. This is the unhealthy fear of God. It is being scared of God. So, what was Moses' reply to the Israelites in the next verse? And Moses said unto the people, Fear not. Fear oh. not. Did you hear that? What did Moses say? Fear not. And then read the rest of it. For God has come to prove you, that, and that his fear may be before your faces, that he sin not. Isn't that a contradiction? Moses is saying, fear not. God has come to see if his fear is in you, to test you. He's saying, don't fear, but fear. It makes no sense. What Moses is saying is this. Don't be scared of God, but fear God. Why? That you sin not. What is the fear of God, dear church? It is not to be scared of God. But it is to be terrified that we might be separated from God. Yes, we love him. And yet, while loving him so much, we are fully aware 
that our sin, our rebellion, our disobedience can separate us from God. So I love you. I love you, O God, but I'm so scared that my sin will separate me from you. I don't want to lose you. That is the fear of God. Reverence is fear blended into love that we have for God. So while we are drawn to him and his majesty and we worship and love him, we are also aware, I am a sinner, have mercy on me. So while loving God, we must reverence God. I ask you parents, you want your children to love you. And you have a child who says, mommy, I love you. And it delights you when your child says, I love you. But then you find that that child is also dishonoring you, disrespecting you, disobeying you. And you say, it's okay. I know you really love me, so it's okay if you disrespect me. Any parent agrees with that? And how do you feel then? You can love God and yet dishonor him, disobey him, disregard him, disrespect him. That cannot be. That is what I did to Miss Cecilia. I loved her. We all loved her. She was a very good teacher. We enjoyed her classes. But while loving her, I started disrespecting her. And this is something we can do to God as well. Please listen. When we love God passionately, but don't fear him, then we will lose our reverence for him and we will go wrong. Once a very famous televangelist, who was, he was a, a, one of the most famous preachers of his time, he committed all kinds of atrocities, including tax evasion and other mail fraud. He was finally convicted, and eventually, uh, he, after his arrest, he received a sentence of 45 years in a federal prison. A pastor who had been following his whole ministry, his preaching, and had really enjoyed listening to him, went to the prison, visited him, and asked him an important question. When did you stop loving God? Because he said all along this man seemed to love God. He was preaching passionately. When did you stop loving him? And this is what... The televangelist said, I want you to listen to what he said. He said, I did not. I did not stop loving God. I loved God all along, but I lost the fear of God. Did you understand? He never stopped loving God, but he stopped fearing God. So when you take fear out of the equation, even the love goes wrong. And then he added, my prison sentence is not God's judgment, but it is God's mercy. Because had I not come into this prison, I would have ended up in hell. So this was God's corrective measure. This was a terrifying place where he woke up from his eternal slumber, became conscious of the presence of God, and for the first time it is in prison, he began to honor God, reverence God, fear God. So what is the meaning of the phrase Moses saying, don't fear God, but fear God. That is what Moses told the Israelites. What he was saying is this, do not be scared of God because that is an unhealthy fear. Sin is what brings this unhealthy fear into us. That is why Adam hid from God. Adam became scared as soon as he sinned. So sin brings in the wrong fear, but the right fear takes sin out. That's why he said, fear God that he sin not. So sin brings the wrong fear in, but the right fear takes that sin out. Love casts out the wrong fear, but it blends with the right fear and establishes reverence. 
Now, how many of you fear God? What is the test? How do we know that we fear God? The best person we can learn from is Jesus, because it is Jesus alone who had that right attitude of fear. So if you look at a prophecy in the Old Testament, Isaiah chapter 11, if you read verse 1 and 2, you realize it is a prophecy about Jesus. Isaiah 11, 1 and 2. And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. We know that this is a prophecy about Jesus and how he brought the gospel to the people. He says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me to preach the gospel. And there are seven things, seven spirits he mentions there. But you notice that the last two are both to do with the fear of God. And I want you to read verse 3 now. And shall make him of quick understanding in the fear of the Lord. And he shall not judge after the sight of his eyes, neither reprove. Okay, see, KJV is not clear there. In the New American Standard Bible and the Revised Version, we read, His delight is in the fear of the Lord. Now, this is about Jesus. What does Jesus delight in? The fear of the Lord. The New Living Translation says his delight is in obeying God. Good News Bible says he finds pleasure in obeying God. And I find this shocking. My understanding of Jesus as the son of his father is that he found great delight in the company of his father. And I thought that is how we all should be. We should just delight in the company of our father. We honor him, we respect him, but we find delight in his company. But this says... He delights in the fear of God and finds pleasure in obeying God. This is a sign we fear Him. So both fear and obedience are blended into that love. Many Christians, they love God, but they don't have this blend of fear and obedience. So let me make an important statement. If we only love God, but do not fear Him, okay? What is this combination? You just love God, but you don't fear Him. There's no reverence. What will happen? Then sin will destroy us. And here is the next sentence. If we only love God, but don't obey Him, then self will destroy us. Sin and self are a a very potent combination. So if we only love God but do not fear Him, sin will destroy us. And if we only love Him but don't obey Him, self will destroy us. So dear church, let us blend fear and obedience into our love for God. Can you see where I'm going with this? In loving God, we will fear Him. And in loving God, we will keep his commandments. King Solomon was following in the footsteps of his father. We know how David really loved God. Solomon also began loving God like his father. But he did not blend the fear of God into that love. His celebrity lifestyle removed that fear from his heart. And he began to destroy himself. I'm not sure at which point he wrote this verse, but at the end of Ecclesiastes, he said the conclusion of the matter is, Fear God and keep His commandments. That's it. So if you want to maintain a healthy relationship with God, we must fear Him and we must obey Him. Now, before I conclude, let me ask this question. How do we know that God really loves those who fear him. We think God loves me because I love him, or God will favor me because I'm passionately worshiping him. No. 
There are verses in the Bible. Psalm 147 verse 11 says, When we fear God, He takes pleasure in us. See, can you imagine that? A person who both loves God and fears Him, God delights in that person. But here is another verse. Psalm 25 14 says, When we fear God, He shares His secrets with us. Do you have secrets? Whom do you share your secrets with? Someone you trust, right? Maybe your best friend. Somebody that you really love is whom you share your secret with. So whom does God share his secrets with? With his best friends. So who are his best friends? Not those who say, oh God, I love you. Anybody can love God because that's what the gospel does. Anybody who hears the gospel must love God because that's a natural reaction. But then, if you go further and say, God, I love you, but I want to reverence you. I want to obey you. I don't want to just live any old how and do my own will. I want to do your will. I want to walk in your ways and keep your commandments. Then God shares his secrets with them. So, in Bethel, in the church of God, there are two kinds of saints. Those who only hear of God's glory, but have no personal encounter with God. And then there are those who have actually seen God's glory. They have experienced what Jacob experienced, and they have woken up and said, the Lord is here. This is the presence of God. Now, the kind of saints who hear of God's glory but have no personal encounter for them, they know everything only in theory. But what was special about Abraham and Moses? They both had an encounter with God. They saw God's glory. They feared him, and they were both called the friend of God. This experience of encountering God changed their lives. When Abraham saw the God of glory, he left Mesopotamia. He never once turned back. He never looked back to the world he left. That is why he never looked to the glory of Sodom. When Moses saw the glory of God, He never once went back to Egypt. He forsook the land and its delights, and he wanted to be with the people of God and suffer with them. Can you see what an encounter with God will do to a person? Jacob's dream, his encounter with God changed his life. Isaiah's vision changed his life. Job's revelation changed his attitude. St. John's revelation in the island of Patmos changed him completely. And Hagar's revelation of God changed her life too. Everyone who has had a personal encounter with God. So you can pray like Moses, God, show me your glory. Francis of Assisi's adoration of God is famous. It was so profound that he would spend an hour or two in God's presence and he would utter just one word, God. And then he would keep silent for a long time because he was so overwhelmed with God. Christianity shook when Martin Luther encountered God. The great awakening began when Jonathan Edwards saw God. The world shook when John Wesley encountered God. Great crowds of people were saved when George Whitfield saw God. And thousands of children were blessed when George Mueller saw God. Who can say what will happen when you, my dear friend, encounter God? Shall we start?
Father, we thank you for bringing us into this beautiful knowledge of your fear. Help us, O oh God, to love you and to blend fear into this love, to obey you, to reverence you, to honor you. And O oh God, we pray that you may help us as a church and all those who are listening at home too, that we all, that we all may learn, O oh God, to reverence you. Oh, let us know that your presence is awesome and yet let us know that Bethel is a terrifying place, not a terror from which we should run away, but a place where we see the gateway of heaven. Help us, Lord, as we put our trust in you, in Jesus' name. Amen. Now may the grace of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit abide with us all until Jesus returns in glory. Amen. God bless you.